of it all for from you are all things all things church all all and to you are all things what that means is that God is in control of every single molecule that has ever existed everything everything there is nothing going on on this planet, in the solar system, in the universe, that God is not in control of. That means everything that's going on with you, in your family, in your life, God is in complete control of, except for your will. We are the only ones that do not obey God completely. And he's given us the opportunity to do that, to obey him completely. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Like the the Jews in olden times, they didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. And they blew it many, many times. We need God's Spirit inside of us. And we have to call on Him all the time with everything that's going on in our lives. Lord, we need you. We need your power. We need your help. We cannot do this without you, nor do we want to. Pray with me, church. Holy Spirit, we call on you, O oh God, God of the universe, God that is in control of every single molecule that has ever existed nor will ever exist. We need your help to walk this walk to live this life, to glorify you in every single thing that we do. Even when we're not aware of it, we need you and your power living in us and through us to do this for your glory, God, because it is our heart's desire that we do this for your glory. We give you the glory, O God. You are holy, Lord. You are holy, and you are righteous, and you are worthy. You are so worthy of our praise. This is the time when the church is given an opportunity to tell the rest of us what God has been speaking in your heart that would glorify the church and that would um, help the church to walk the walk and to live the life that he so deserves. And if anybody has something that God has been speaking to you about that you believe the church would benefit from, I would love it if you would raise your hand and I could bring you the mic so we can all hear what God would want to say to the church through you. Lord wants to send a word of encouragement. There are times that we are challenged. There are times we have to sit back and acknowledge that God is working, even though we don't see it. God is a powerful, sovereign God. We are called to stand, but there are times when we can't under our own, but we can always stand in awe of God. So sometimes we need to just sit on his lap, lean into him. Hear his heart beat and know how much he loves you.
Uh, the, the Lord says in his word, uh, Paul, I believe, said to Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you. So the Lord is speaking to us to uh, know the gift or gifts that he has given us and to stir them up and use them for his glory. So what I'm hearing is God talking to his church and saying to his church, stir up the Holy Spirit in you and trust me. I'm either God and I'm sovereign and you're going to rely on me or I'm not, at least to you. Stir up the Holy Spirit. Ask him for help. Trust him no matter what, no matter what. And when you can't just trust him, you trust him anyway. He's been saying to me, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe also, you believe in God, but you believe in also in me. God, God says to be strong when, when, you, when people say to, um, to believe in th this, you need to be strong to say no. I believe in Jesus, even though if they make fun of you or, or like, or be rude to you, you got to be strong in, in the name of Jesus. Yesterday I was praying and singing um, he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, I open my hands. He's got big hands. He's got big hands to hold the whole world. And it just blessed, does it? Oh, it just blessed the socks off me. <laughs> Are you feeling encouraged, church? Yeah, because that's exactly what God wants to do. He loves you. He loves you. And he only wants what's best for you. And it may not feel like it sometimes, but it's true. It's just true. So walk in that, church. I've got to get those, uh, ooh, there we are. I got to get those uh, pictures of uh, Oh Sunny Day up there. The kids, we've got some pictures and videos of the kids eating these plates mounded full of food and it's a beautiful thing when you realize just how little the kids over there eat normally for them to have a plate just mounded with food to celebrate Easter is a lot of fun it's really special and uh, and I'm just so thankful for people like Pastor Frank who work hard to make that happen and for all of you guys who support the orphanage over there 172 kids in uh, Lake Victoria over in Uganda so thank you so much to you guys um, Okay, well, a couple things. Yes, one, do sign up if you're interested in the parenting class, Rooted, the men's interest. Um, sign up for one of those, and those are for the first 10, 12 weeks, and then we'll have new groups after that. So we'll have something for the ladies after that and uh, different classes. So put down what you would like to see coming up soon. So, um, Also, Ken was hoping that the uh, Pinewood Derby next week would be in place of the sermon. Uh, I just want to let you know that's not the case. Uh, the Pinewood Derby will actually be after after service, uh, so be prepared to stay next week for that Pinewood Derby. Um, and there, there you go. I, uh, I'm excited. I was making the kids' cars uh, yesterday, and I'm cheating. I found a car that I made in uh, Cub Scouts, and I'm going to use that. Yeah, it's the car is over. Thir it's about 30 years old, and I'm it's made new wheels. But other than that, I'm bringing it back to life, man. So it's an antique. That's right. When you get to be my age. Okay. Well, is there anything else I should say? Like, I usually feel like I have a few things to shoot off, but uh, I can't think of anything other than, you know, welcome back to the Cole family. It's good to see you guys. Uh, Woohoo. Uh, other than that, I don't think so. Jaden, you're going to see a smile today? Oh, come on. Oh, the pouty face. 
There's a smile. There we go. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us together today, uh, for bringing together your family, that we get to be a part of the family of God and here as a local expression of it, that um, we aren't just friends, Lord, but that we get to be brothers and sisters, um, mothers and fathers, and we thank you for that. It's a privilege. Lord, as we look at the word today, um, I ask that you would give insight, Father, and uh, help us to hear your heart for us and for our lives and for this world, that we would hear and respond to what you have to say, Jesus, with humble hearts. Um, Lord, I pray it wouldn't be man's opinion, but the Word of God. Lord, and uh, if we have time for question and answer afterwards, I pray that you'd be in those questions, be in the answers. Lord, that it would be enlightening and encouraging, Lord, and uh, that we would all walk out of here with fresh vision and strength and passion from the Holy Spirit to live for you, shining as stars in this generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, so my intention, and maybe I shouldn't even say it because you never know. Uh, my intention is to try to end a little early and to leave time for questions on the, the last 14 chapters of Revelation that we've been through. We'll see if that happens. Okay? Well, let's go ahead and get going. Today... Um, this time, I'm actually, I'm gonna, I want to look back at those last two harvests in Revelation chapter 14, because I ran out of time on Easter. You guys were all there. You saw it. I went long. Um, I wanted to talk about those two harvests uh, before we move into chapter 15. And the next time uh, that we look at Revelation, it'll be chapter 15, and it'll be Kids Sunday, and we'll be talking about uh, some pretty cool things at the, there at the beginning. Well, Chapter 15 is a short chapter. Some pretty neat things in chapter 15. I'm excited about it. But today, uh, the sermon is about the two harvests that are going to happen at the end of the world. So last week, we looked at Revelation 14 after we talked about the gospel message. And in Revelation uh, 14, it starts with these three angels who come down and proclaim three messages. And the three messages are, one, the gospel, the good news. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He came to rescue us and redeem us. And two was the declaration of God's vengeance, that there is a city called Babylon the Great, or a city could be a country, and they are living in luxury, and they are drinking it poetically, symbolically, it says later on in the book, they're drinking the blood of the saints. That means they are just rejoicing in persecuting people who love Christ. They're wealthy, they take life easy, they exploit the poor, it's full of oppression and slavery. And this angel comes and says, her judgment has come. The judgment on Babylon the Great has come. And then the third angel comes and warns everybody saying, look, you will also be judged if you receive the mark of the beast, if you worship this antichrist. Answers, Lord, that it would be enlightening and encouraging, Lord, and uh, that we would all walk out of here with fresh vision and strength and passion from the Holy Spirit to live for you, shining as stars in this generation. False signs and false miracles. It's the one that people often call Antichrist. And so the third angel flies and he warns everybody, if anyone worships this man, they too will be judged like Babylon the Great was judged with fire. They'll be tortured because they have rejected everything good that is in God. The only thing that's left for them is everything bad. <laughs> it's like the absence of light. If you reject all light, the only thing that's left for you to live in is darkness. If you reject everything that's good, the only thing that's left for you is everything that's miserable and terrible. And the angel warns everybody that those who reject the good news, the gospel, all that's left is everything that's terrible. And I want to pick up at the end of these three angels. And, but first, I just want to say, and I pointed this out earlier, that um, the Antichrist is pictured as like seven heads and, um, you know, ten horns and coming up out of the ocean. And there's not very many people who really believe that there's going to be a man with seven heads and ten horns who comes up out of the Pacific, kind of like Godzilla, and starts climbing on towers and breathing fire. Like, that's... 
we see this, we recognize that this is imagery, this is symbolism that means something. It, it, it's not just silly or nonsense. It has a meaning. It, God had John write this down for a purpose and for a meaning, but it's not literal. And in the same way, we're about to read about these harvests where Jesus uses a, um, a sickle, kind of like this, and he reaps the earth. And we recognize that Jesus doesn't have actually like a, you know, a 3,000 mile wide scythe that he's going to swing across the world. <laughs> like, this is a symbol. This is a picture. It's imagery. And so in the same way, when there are three angels who are flying overhead announcing the gospel and announcing um, the judgment on Babylon the Great and announcing the fact of hell, that could also be imagery pointing to something else. And personally, I believe that we are going to be involved in the proclamation of those angels. That whatever the image is, whatever the picture is, I believe that the reason we're here on earth is to be proclaiming the good news. The reason God doesn't take you to heaven as soon as you're baptized is because now you are called to go out and make disciples just like someone did for you. And so we are supposed to be involved in this proclamation around the world to every tribe, tongue, and nation. And I want to pick up at the end of those three angels here uh, in verse, fifth, excuse me, verse 12 of chapter 14. It says, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So these declarations of the three angels telling everybody the good news and warning everybody about judgment, it's a call for us to endure. It's a call for us to persevere. Something is going to happen to us as a result of this proclamation. You keep reading in verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So what's the picture? It's that not only... Is there possibly three angels or something else symbolically? But also we are joining in them and we are telling people the good news. We're running around and letting people know and like sowing our seed. Anna, have you heard about Jesus? Do you, yeah, that's wonderful. Al, do you, you want to follow the Lord? Oh, no, he doesn't. He's mad. He's, he's trying to hurt me. Ken, do you, uh, Ken not even listening to me. Do you, and we're running around and we're telling people the good news. But as a result, we're suffering. As a result, some of us are dying. Like, that's the picture. That's what's happening is this good news is being proclaimed around the world. But as we go out around the world and tell people we are suffering, we're being persecuted, and some of us are dying. It says, a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. This death is not a defeat. This persecution, the Bible says, is not a bad thing. What does Jesus say in the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? The greatest message. He has these nine beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You remember that? And he ends these beatitudes with, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad in that day. For in the same way they treated the prophets who were before you, when we're persecuted, when we are bold for Jesus Christ and people are mean to us because of it, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad, right? That's kind of backwards thinking. Why would we be rejoice and be glad when we are suffering? If you'd go ahead and go on to the, the next slide. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Paul Starts out Philippians chapter 3 by saying, rejoice in the Lord, brothers. Again, I say rejoice. And he talks about how we are those who worship God by the Spirit, who trust in Jesus and put no confidence in our accomplishments. And he says, I used to be somebody who worked hard to put confidence in my accomplishments. I was born of the right people. Right? I was a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin in Israelite. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I followed the law zealously like a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of my people. I was righteous, did everything right, crossed every T, dotted every I. It could be like a kid saying, yeah, I grew up in a pastor's family. 
And I went to church every single Sunday. I was baptized as soon as I was old enough to make the decision. I started memorizing verses in Awana at age five. As a matter of fact, I went to Awana already with some verses memorized. And, and, uh, and then at school, I studied and I studied. I was valedictorian. Graduated top of my class. Went to Bible college. I'm something special. Right? Paul, that's what Paul's saying. Like, this is what I could have argued about myself. But then he says, now, now that I have found Jesus, everything that I could have bragged about, that's garbage. None of that matters. Now, those aren't bad things. It's not bad to be born an Israelite. It's not bad that Paul was circumcised according to the custom of his people. That's not a bad thing. It's not bad that he tried to follow the law. But he's saying, my confidence in those things, it's garbage. How could I ever think that I would be good enough, that God would accept me when I know my heart, when I know the wickedness that lives inside of me, when I know what I have said and what I have done and what I have thought? It's ridiculous. And he goes on, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss. All the stuff I used to put pride in, that's a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything in this life is a loss compared to one thing, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And Paul did. Rejected by his community. Killed by those who used to respect him. Walking away from probably a lucrative career and living as an itinerant missionary. Poor, Oftentimes with no clothes. Often he was stoned almost to death once they thought he was dead. That's why they stopped. Beaten with rods three times. Shipwrecked. I've suffered the loss of all things. But I count all of that garbage. Rubbish. Technically, it's um, dung. I'll let you fill in the blank there. In order that I may gain Christ. Everything else in life is poop compared to gaining Christ and being found in him. And not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, my own efforts, trying to be good enough, trying to earn it, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. The freedom of knowing I'm loved and accepted. That no mistake of mine, no failure of mine, can ever take away his love. Because my salvation is not based on my effort, my accomplishment. It's based on his grace. And as long as I keep my faith in him, as long as I keep trusting him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the life of the resurrection of Jesus Christ inside of me, like we're reading in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 last week, the greatness of the power of God was displayed not only in resurrecting Jesus to life, but then seating him at his right hand in heaven, far above all rule, power, or authority in this world or in the world to come. And in the same way, God's power is displayed in raising you and I from life, to, from death to life, from our old way of life, from the old sins we used to stay bound in, to a new life in Jesus, free by grace. But grace doesn't leave us where we were. It takes us and makes us something different. And then seating us with him in the heavenly places, crowning us with glory and honor. That I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. And that's where it loses a lot of the American audience. Now we're, we're good. We're following right along. This is great gospel stuff right up to the second half of verse 10. And may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. But what did Jesus say? Pick up your cross and follow me. Anyone who loves this life more than me is not worthy of me. We need to be like Paul and consider everything else in life garbage. 
compared to the greatness of knowing and being one with Jesus. And one powerful way to be united with Jesus is through suffering. Because Jesus suffered for you and for me. Jesus suffered. He came from heaven, from the, the best place you could ever think or imagine, better than you could ever think or imagine. And he was king there. It wasn't like he was just a part of it. He was like king, lord over it all. And came down and lived in a barn, born with poopy animals, and laid down in their messy food bowl as an infant, as a newborn. Grew up in poverty and obscurity. And then for three or four years, preached the good news to a bunch of people who did not understand, who got angry at him every time, people who wanted to kill him. He was on the run, trying to protect his life, trying to stay alive long enough to accomplish what God had put him there for. He suffered for you and I. And then not to speak of the cross. I mean, we, we love Easter, but there's never as good of a turnout for a Good Friday service. Jesus, and um, I mean, you know the garden. I'm going to go a little afield here, but like the, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in the middle of it, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day's got enough trouble of its own. And then you see Jesus in the garden, and he's weeping, and he's crying out to God, and he's in such agony as he anticipates the cross. And the burden of the weight of sin that he's going to carry, your and mine sin, the sin of murderers, the sin of adulterers, the sin of rapists, that sin is going to be weighing him down on the cross. And he's sweating blood as he looks forward to that moment, crying out, God, if there is any way, take this cup from me. Now, Jesus followed his own advice because his whole life he knew this was coming. He told the disciples over and over, I will be rejected. And you could almost feel the cloud come over his face. But then he turns and he moves on. He's not going to worry about that right now. He's got work to do. But now in the garden, it, the day has come. This is the day. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This day is full of more trouble than you or I will ever know because of him. And he's weeping. And his best friend, well, one of his best friends comes and betrays him. And soldiers carry him away in the night. And he stands trial before a bunch of sinners. And the sinless son of God is condemned to death by a bunch of wicked men. Who would... And he's beaten. And he's mocked. And they take the crown of thorns, right? His long, sharp thorns that grow over there and twist it together and put it on his head and start... It's not enough that they just put it, like, put it on his head, but like... They give him a staff like he's a king, a scepter, and they start to beat him with that staff on his head where the crown of thorns is. And then he's humiliated. He's brought out in front of the crowd with his purple robe, bloodied and sweated and bruised. And they said, here's your king. And he's just mocked, insulted. And they cry out for him to be crucified, and, and Pilate has him scourged, 39 lashes, ripping his flesh apart, down to the bone, lacerating his back over and over and over again, ripping out his sides. And, and then naked, humiliated, nailed to that cross, and hung there. This is what he did for you and me. And so when Paul says that I may know him and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that's not a pretty picture. And only someone desperately in love with Christ would want to know him so much that they would also know him in his hour of agony. Know him in his pain, in his humiliation, what the world counted as his defeat. Because when we know him that way,
we'll become like him. Second Corinthians chapter three or four, at the end of the chapter, it says, We behold him with unveiled faces, where we see him and we are transformed into his image, his glory, from one level of glory to another. And the only way there is through the cross. We have to behold him that way so that we can also behold his resurrection. When we share his sufferings, we can share the victory over his sufferings. When we share his defeat, we can share his resurrection. But there's no way to know resurrection without death. And so Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sakes. Because in that moment, you are becoming like Christ. You are sharing in his sufferings. You are doing what is right and what is good. And in return for it, you are being kicked and goaded, laughed at and rejected. And you are never more like Christ than in that moment. If you maintain an attitude and a heart of love like he did. Love towards those kicking you. Love towards those rejecting you. Because that is the victory. And that is the moment when you become in the image of God. Not the image of the beast that we're called to worship, self-aggrandizement and pleasure, but in sacrificial love, laying our life down for someone else. One of the most um, meaningful things I've heard from the Lord in my prayer time is, uh, when I see you, I see my son. When I see you, I see my son. Because I know how wretched I am. I know how wicked my heart is. But when God sees me, he sees his son. He sees Jesus. He sees someone who's loved and accepted and chosen and forgiven. And that's worth the loss of all things. When he sees you, he sees his son. You are his daughter. And it's with that in mind that then we, we go on and we read, I looked and behold a white cloud had seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. I looked and behold a white cloud. And uh, there are some who argue about whether or not this is Jesus, but he, like the, another angel, another angel, another angel, like this is... And then after, the, another angel. And there's like three angels listed before and three angels listed after. This is the only time where it says, one like a son of man. And what this is coming from is the book of Daniel in chapter 7. Um, it says in the book of Daniel, it's a picture of the end. As a matter of fact, Daniel sees this picture of a beast coming up out of the sea, just like John did. And, and one of the horns, one of the kings of this beast, this, this kingdom... One of the kings has this mouth to boast great things, to claim to be God, and he starts to make war against God's people, and he starts to overcome them. He starts to kill God's people, and it seems like he's going to win until the king comes and sits on his throne, and books are opened, and judgment begins. And it's at that point I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, in a white cloud, right, like in Revelation, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And it goes on to talk about how the kingdom is given to this Son of Man. And that's why Jesus calls himself the Son of Man over and over in the Gospels. He's talking about this moment right here when he will come back as king and all the world will bend the knee. And he actually quotes this verse when he's on trial in front of the high priest. The high priest says, are you the Messiah? Tell us who you are. And Jesus' response in Matthew 26 is Jesus said to him, you have said also, you have said so, you said that I'm the Messiah. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. 
to the man who's about to condemn him to death, Jesus speaks the truth. And for quoting Scripture, the high priest of God condemns him to death. Matthew 24, 30, this same thing about coming in the clouds, Jesus warned his disciples what would come at the end of the time. He says, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they all will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The Son of Man coming on the clouds. That's what we're reading about right now. If, if you look at the next verse, we're going to look at several of these because it's Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. We talked about that at the beginning of Revelation. You can look back at that sermon. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, as Jesus is being raised up to heaven in the clouds, when he had said these things, as they were looking up, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And in another gospel, it says that he, he was blessing them. And, and while he was blessing them, he was raised up to heaven. Like, he couldn't stop blessing them. Like, he couldn't, he couldn't get out uh, as much as he wanted to bless before God's like, all right, come on, Jesus, it's time to come home. He's like, wait, I'm not done. I want to keep blessing. I just love that picture, his heart towards us. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, the 12 disciples, after Jesus' death and resurrection, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come. How did, he, how did he leave? In the heaven, in the clouds, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So what are we looking for? What are we expecting? We're expecting that someday we're going to be looking out of these windows or your car windows or your home windows. And we're going to see these clouds up there. And guess who you're going to see in those clouds? Like, that is our hope. That is our anticipation. And it's not make-believe like the Easter bunny. It is real. It is true. It is what we have to look forward to. I mean, if you keep going through these verses. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18. For this we declare to you, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, those of us who survive, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. We're talking about the resurrection here. Then we who are alive, now we're talking about the rapture, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, this is, I, I just, I read once an author who was talking about Peter, uh, like, like a, writing a story, a fictional story about, a real, about the real person, Peter. And in that story, like, Peter was walking along, and every now and then he would just glance up at the skies, like he's going along on this trip to another town, to talk about Jesus, and everybody, he just keeps looking up. And the reason he kept looking up is because he knew that one of these days Jesus would be coming down. And that thought is a sobering thought. Jesus talks in Matthew 24, he talks about the end. And he says, you're going to see me coming back, the Son of Man in the clouds. In Matthew 25, he talks about being ready. Being ready. Because you don't want to be caught off guard. He talks about the ten virgins, five of whom forgot to bring extra oil for the lamp. And the groom arrived late for the wedding. And those, they had fallen asleep, and the five who didn't have oil for their lamp couldn't, couldn't light the way for him, didn't get to come into the wedding feast. He says, be ready. We should be anticipating Jesus' return, and it should make us think about the way that we're living. If Jesus were to come back right now, like, what would be your response? There's the old joke about um, the preacher who was preaching and then uh, threw in the back. The sun was at just the right point in the sky that when the back doors opened, the sun burst through the back doors and someone who happened to be dressed in white came in and the preacher jumped into the baptismal. <laughs> right? <laughs> Apparently, he didn't feel ready. <laughs> well, how are you living your life? What, what are you living for? Are you living consumed with the things of this world? Or are they garbage to you and are you living for Jesus? Now, are you the steward who's eating and getting drunk and taking life easy and beating on his people around him? Or are you the steward who is waiting diligently for his master's return, loving and taking care of the people around him? Jesus is coming back. Point of fact. One day we're going to look up and see him. 
We need to make it our goal to strive to always be excited. Be excited. Not anxious like, oh, man, I hope Jesus doesn't come back right now while I'm in the middle of this movie because that would be awkward. Or, or I hope Jesus doesn't come back right now before I make it right with that person I just had an argument with because that would be kind of awkward. Now, I'm not talking about sinning and losing your salvation because that, that that's not the way that works. What I'm talking about is being able to look up with joy. When we were on top of the, on, on the, in the Bible times, the roofs were flat and they had little railings and there was like an extra room. Being up on the roof and seeing him coming and not, clouds got someone like, well, quick, I got to get home and make something right real quick. No, but living in a place where you are always ready for the return of the king with a free and easy conscience, with a joyful expectation. We should have joy as we think forward to Jesus' return. Like I used to, as a kid, think, well, I'm excited for Jesus to come back, but I hope it's after I turn 16 and get a license. Or I'm excited for Jesus to come back, but I hope it's after I get married and experience what all that's like. Yeah, I, I'm excited for Jesus to come back, but I hope it's after, like, whatever. No, this is, everything else is rubbish. This is the best thing ever. And we need to have that perspective. The crown. You put up the next slide. Um, looking back at Revelation chapter 14. Um, oh, did I not finish that? Oh, yeah. Go ahead and go back. I guess I should read the end of that passage. I thought I did. Uh, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Um, and then the... In the end of that passage, verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Oh, yeah, we read that. Okay, I don't know what I'm thinking. Sorry about that. I'm confused. Okay, Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. We're not going to have time for question and answer. Okay, so the golden crown... Um, there are two different words in Greek for crown. One of them is like a diadem of authority, like the crown of authority. The other, like the king would wear. The other word for crown is, the, is like Doug, Doug Beale has been working on a, a medal for the Pinewood Derby. He's got this cool little circle, and he's going to paint him blue for first and, and red for second and green for third place. And, and it's this cool-looking thing. And, and back when they used to compete in the games, in the Olympics, back in, in ancient Greece and Rome, they would, the winner, the victor, would get a crown. And when a general came back from a war, if he's victorious, they would put a crown on his head. And sometimes when, when a, a husband and wife or a fiancés are getting married, they would actually put a crown on their head to celebrate a victory, to cel- to a, a celebration. It's that sort of thing. We don't really do that much anymore, but they did it a lot then. And that crown was a different word, and it was made out of like leaves and, and branches and stuff, and, and, and this crown that fades, they would talk about. Right? And so this little, you know, kind of like you would link daisy chains together and make a little crown for yourself. That kind of thing. Except cooler because, like, there's people all around cheering and shouting for you. Well, that's the word here where it says with a golden crown. It's the second kind of crown. It's the crown that a victor wears. The crown that a conqueror wears. What's interesting is when Jesus was in the guard, was in, um, was in front of Pilate, he had a crown. And they used this word, not the crown of authority, but this victor's crown, probably because it was woven out of branches and looked more like that kind of a laurel crown, a branchy crown, a leafy crown, instead of looking like a kingly crown. That's, and so he had this crown on his head. And when he comes back, he will have a golden crown, a golden victor's crown. Because he has already fought the fight. He fought that fight in the garden. He fought that fight on the cross. And he has already won it. And he's coming back as the victor with a very different crown on his head. Charles Spurgeon wrote about this. He said, How different it will be to see him with a crown of gold upon his head from what it was to see him wearing that terrible crown of thorns which the cruel soldiers plated and thrust upon his brow. The word used here does not usually refer to the diadem of power, but to the crown won in conflict. 
It's very remarkable that it should be said that when Christ comes to judge the world, he will wear the garland of victory, the crown which he has won in the great battle which he has fought. How significant of his final triumph will that crown of gold be about those brows that were once covered with bloody sweat when he was fighting the battle for our salvation. And so he's wearing the victor's crown, riding on the cloud of heaven, comes. He comes. And an angel, Revelation 14 says, an angel comes. Another angel came out of the temple, calling out with a voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the, our harvest of the earth is fully ripe. I thought that was weird that an angel is telling Jesus what to do, but remember what Jesus said. I don't know the day or the hour. No one knows but my Father in heaven. And so here we have an angel coming out of the temple, coming from God the Father, telling Jesus, who's been sitting on that cloud waiting and ready, the hour has come. Put in your sickle and reap. The harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. <laughs> Based on everything that we've been talking about, him riding on the cloud, you, you immediately think, well, this means the rapture. And I think it does. But I think it also means we were just talking about um, the gospel being preached to every tribe, tongue, and nation in the earth. And what did Jesus said? He said, the harvest, you say there's still like five more months to the harvest, but I tell you, lift up your eyes and look, the fields are white unto harvest. Pray unto the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And here we're reading about the harvest being ripe. And, and people harvesting the gospel, going out around the world. So this harvest that we're talking about here, I believe it's also talking about a revival. That even as there is a great falling away and people receiving the mark of the beast, there will also be a great revival concurrently of people accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, being saved, being redeemed, because the harvest fields are ripe. Because a lot of times in tribulation and trial and suffering and difficult seasons of this world is when we see the greatest advance of the gospel when we're not comfortable, fat, and blind. And then the other thing that harvest could be, it could be persecution. It could be martyrdom, which makes sense because there is just a, the angel, the spirit, just said, yes, this calls for the perseverance of the saints. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. And now we see this angel, the Jesus coming and harvesting the earth. And so you see these three pictures. What is this reaping? And, and personally, I think it's, it's kind of all three. First, revival, people getting saved. But then as a consequence of that revival, in response to our sharing about Jesus, a great martyrdom. Because, like, think about when Stephen died, he looked up and he saw Jesus in his glory. Whenever we die for the Lord, he is right there, ready to receive us, ready to bring us home. And then finally, the rapture, which is signified by the fact that he's coming with the clouds and uh, the finality of this. And then the earth was harvested. And then the second harvest we're about to read of. So that you got the, the revival and great persecution and martyrdom and rapture. And if you want to share in the sufferings of Christ, some of you are already sharing because of physical ailments. Some of you, it is painful to sit through this service because of your body. Now, I'm not saying that it's God's will for you to be sick or to be suffering. But I am saying that your suffering and your sickness and your pain is being used redemptively by your God to make you more like Christ. But if you really want to experience the suffering that the Bible says that we are going to experience, by the way, it, it is a promise, start sharing Jesus. Um, I've got, I don't know how many verses here. Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew 10, 38. I, I should print, I'll make a list of these at some point and give them to you. Luke 24, 26. But it goes on. Romans 8, 17. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. 2 Timothy 1, 8. 2 Timothy 2, 11. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Revelation 7, 14. But the one I want to focus on right now is 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 
If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be a saint, ashamed, a christ Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, if you suffer for the name, if you want to become more like Jesus, if you want to share in his glory and his power, then invite suffering and invite persecution by living boldly for the name of Christ in this world. Share about Jesus to your family. I know somebody who just traveled a long way, spent some money to go see a dying family member, and she didn't exactly welcome him with open arms. But he wanted to share in Christ and share the good news of Jesus with someone that they, she would have a chance. If you want to share in the sufferings of Christ like we've been talking about, the best way to do that is to be bold in your witness for him and embrace what comes with rejoicing, like Peter said. And the reason why that's so important, it's not just because like Romans 8, 17 says, if children, if we're God's children, we're, God's, we're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Not just because we're going to partake in this final rapture, this harvest, this glory of Jesus Christ, but this is so important because of the other harvest that's coming. In Revelation Chapter 14, as we finish this uh, just very quickly, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth. Notice not the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. We're not talking about the vine of Christ, but those who are the vine of the earth for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. And that was the beautiful image that we ended Easter celebration on. Um, this is talking about, if you look at um, other passages, for instance, uh, Isaiah 63, verse 1, Joel 3.13, Isaiah 34, and especially Revelation 19.15, this is talking about Armageddon. The, the people of the earth are being gathered together in one place in rebellion against God. Matter of fact, as we go into the bold judgments, which are the last series of seven judgments in Revelation, we, we are nearing the end, um, you'll see that they actually are preparing, they're drying up the river, and they're preparing the way for this Armageddon battle. And uh, 1,600 stadia, there could be other symbolism behind that number, but it's about 184 miles. And if you measure from the top of modern-day Israel to about the midpoint of that, of its, it, it ends on this diagonal line. From the top to the middle of that diagonal line, it's roughly 184 miles. Um, and the horse's bridle, Jesus is said to come back riding on a horse, and the armies of heaven behind him on horses. And so the picture that you see in this last harvest is Israel being filled with the enemies of God, rebelling against Jesus Christ. They know Jesus is coming. They know that these judgments are from God. By this point, there's no doubt, and they are furious and want to rebel against him and hurt his people. They've already conquered Jerusalem. That's why it's outside of the city. And they fill the land of Israel, and Jesus comes and tramples the winepress of the wrath of God against God's enemies. There is... Um, just like there is a great harvest, there is a great apostasy, a great falling away. Just like there is a great martyrdom, Armageddon will be terrible. It will be awful. And just like there is a great rapture for us, there will be a great judgment for those who reject God. Hell is real. It's eternal. It's awful. It's not God's heart. It's not God's will for you and I. Hell was created for Satan and his demons. But those of us who reject God, who reject his mercy and his grace, who spit in his face and turn our back on him, there is nowhere else left for us but the lake of fire. 
And that's the other reason why it's so important that we share in the sufferings of Jesus and boldly proclaim the gospel and the coming judgment, lest other people's blood be on our heads. Like, if I knew that a forest fire was coming to Terrebonne and that those who stayed in Terrebonne would burn alive in that fire, but that those who went to Prineville would be saved, and I didn't tell anybody in Terrebonne that that fire was on its way, the blood of the whole town would be on my head. All of your blood would be on my head. We know, we know that a judgment is coming, a fire is coming, and those who turn and run to Christ will be safe. But if we don't warn people, won't their blood be on our head? Father, I stand with my brothers and sisters and confess that I have not seen this world as garbage and you as the greatest price the way that I should have. I have not embraced suffering the way that I should have. And I have not been your messenger the way that I should have. The only way, Lord, for this to change is for our agreement with you and your Holy Spirit. I pray for the Holy Spirit to fill us with a love for you, a boldness to proclaim the name of Jesus, and a strength to endure opposition and suffering in his name. I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us with wisdom, strength, grace, joy, peace, and boldness today. And that we would live every day as if it could be your day when we'll look up and see you, Jesus when our faith will be our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to receive Jesus, not a God who's foaming wrath mad at you, but someone who loves you and cares about you and has done everything, including laying his own life down, to make a way for you to be rescued, to come back into relationship with him and to know him, he doesn't make it hard. I mean, you heard me say, it costs everything. But to receive him, you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he came from the dead. You will be saved. And at that point, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, and it's no longer about you anymore. It's about what God starts to do inside of you as you allow him. If you'd like to start that journey today, would you raise your hand and I'll pray with you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Would you guys all pray with me? Father God, I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I confess Jesus as my Lord. And I pray he would rescue me. I believe in him. And I accept your forgiveness. I ask the Holy Spirit would help me to live for you from now on. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, um, I love you all.
And uh, I appreciate you coming today. And um, I'm excited for uh, the Pinewood Derby next week. And I'm excited for Revelation 15. All right. God bless you. See you next week.